All right. Let, let's give the FFA a hand for that great meal. That was outstanding. Can everybody hear me okay in the back? Good. All right, it's my, my pleasure to be here tonight. And, uh, and what I really want to talk about tonight is, is how, do we, how do we manage pastures when input costs are so high? And my, my goal tonight is to give you 10 tips to help you deal with these high input costs tonight. And I'd like to draw attention to my co-author, Dr. John Grove. Um, Dr. Grove and I have worked a lot on these presentations this winter about uh, the cost of soil fertility and uh, in how we should handle that in, in forage livestock operations across the state. And uh, he's, a, um, he's our soil scientist at the research station. Before I get started, I'll just give you a quick update on the research station. Most of you probably know we, we were hit by a tornado in December. And I mean, it, it wasn't, a, wasn't a graze, it was a direct hit to the research station. We've got 20, 29 structures, 24 were destroyed. So, um, so, well, I don't have an office right now. We're kind of working out of our house, and, and, um, but, but we're going to rebuild, and the cleanup stage is almost over. We've got most everything gone now, and, um, and I was, I don't know if I'm being punished, but I was put in charge of debris removal from our fields at the research station. So we have been picking debris up every day for the last two months. Cold, snow, rain, we're, at, we're out there picking debris up with five-gallon buckets. We've been over more than 1,000 acres so far. So, and in, in I'll tell you, the, the worst part about picking debris up from a field is you'll walk and pick it up and turn around, and, and you miss something. So, it, it's been a challenge, and the best part about the debris removal has been the number of people that have come out to help. We've had people all the way from Oklahoma and Wisconsin that have come to help pick debris up at the research station, so that's great. If you're interested in coming to pick debris up, we'd love to have you. So just give me a call, and my number's on here, and uh, we'll let you bend over. We measured how many times we bend over in one day? 1,500 times to pick something up. We walk about six miles a day, so, so it'll get you in shape if you're not in shape. I'm not going to lie to you. After the first week of debris removal, I sat down in my easy chair, and there was not one piece of my whole body that didn't hurt. So I'm a little bit better now. All right, so let's talk a little bit about pasture management. And this is kind of the 800-pound the grill in the room is fertilizer prices. And I don't need to tell anybody in this room what, what has happened to fertilizer prices. They're three times as high as they were 18 months ago. I mean, right now, nitrogen is about a dollar a pound. And, and that's really putting pressure on, on forage livestock operations. Um, you know, potash is um, around 65 cents a pound. We're looking at uh, DAP that the, after adjusted for nitrogen is somewhere around 55 cents a pound. So significantly... Uh, a significant increase in fertilizer prices. So what I want to do is, is talk about 10 tips to help kind of get you through this time. I mean, fertilizer, fertilizer prices are going to come down, but it's going to take a little while. It, and you're going to ask me when. I don't know when they're going to come down. But what I want to do is just give you some tips to kind of get you through this next year and a half or so in, in terms of managing fertility on your farm. So, so the, the first tip is that there is no silver bullets. You know, whenever, w whenever we have high fertilizer prices like this, people come out of the woodwork with a jug of this or a jug of that, and you put five ounces of this on an acre, and it's going to replace a, a ton of ammonium nitrate. It's just not true. There, there is no silver bullets out there. So we want to avoid products that sound too good to be true. Just like your mother told you, if it sounds too good to be true, then chances are it's, it's probably not true. Um, there are some biological products that show promise, but, but they're not quite there yet. The only biologic that we recommend right now is inoculum for clover. We know that works, so if you're planting frost-seeding clover or planting clover into your pastures, make sure you're using a pre-inoculated seed or that you're inoculating that seed prior 
the planting. So make sure if someone's trying to sell you something that sounds too good to be true, ask them for replicated data from a university trial. Guys that sell this stuff in a jug, you, you know, that doesn't really work, they hate it when people ask that because university data shows that it just doesn't work. So if, if the only data they're offering you is a testimonial from somebody that you don't know, then, then chances of it working are pretty slim. This is one of the products we've been testing. We started to test this last summer. It's, it's called liquid calcium or bioactive liquid calcium or ProCal or something like that. And um, it, it promises a lot of things. It's, it promises it's going to neutralize soil acidity, which, which it does not. It's, it's chemically impossible for it to neutralize soil acidity. Increases the movement of N, P, and K into the plant, aerates your soil. Increases water infiltration. Improves cell wall structure. I mean, just a whole list of things. And, and the best thing you can do with this, this type of a product is just don't use it. So one of, the, one of the competitive advantages that we have in cow-calf operations is, is what we call nutrient cycling. So in a, in a cow-calf operation, we've got nutrient imports in, um, that come into the system in the form of things like fertilizer, um, any manure that we may scrape up and, and put back on that, that pasture or hayfield, legumes like clover that are fixing nitrogen and bringing it into the system, and then anything that we feed, hay that we're feeding has nutrients in it. If we're feeding commodity feeds, the commodity feeds have nutrients. Any mineral mixes, they all have nutrients in them. They're bringing these nutrients into this system. These nutrients then get kind of cycled around this system, right? So the plant takes the nutrient up, the cow eats the nutrient, and then the cow deposits that nutrient back on the soil in the form of dung and urine. About 80 to 90%, depending on the nutrient, get recycled through the animal. So so what it's eating, it's coming out the back at a rate of 80 to 90%. And then we have exports from our system. And in the cow-calf system, our exports are really pretty small. So, so normally it would be a calf that we're removing from that system. Some work that, um, that was done by uh, uh, a researcher at the University of Missouri showed that a cow-calf pair removes about 10 pounds of nitrogen per year about seven pounds of P2O5 in, in about a pound of K2O. So, so if I'm stocked at, at two acres per cow-calf unit, which, which I hope you all are, because if you're higher than that, it's probably a little bit too high. If I'm stocked around two acres per cow-calf unit, I mean, all of a sudden I'm removing, you know, a, a five pounds of nitrogen, a couple, two, three or four pounds of pot, phosphorus and less than a pound of potash. The, the point that I want to make is that nutrient removal is very low from a well-managed cow-calf system. So, so tip number two is that we want to soil sample pastures. And, and a lot of people are sitting here saying, well, fertilizer prices are so high right now, I'm not even going to bother because I'm not putting any fertilizer on. But this is really the time when you need to think about, about soil sampling pastures. Um, soil testing quantifies phosphorus and potassium and gives you a soil pH. Um, it does not quantify nitrogen, right? And it provides you baseline data. It's, it's impossible to manage something if you don't have data on it. So it provides you that baseline. And it's even more important now to, um, to soil sample than it is when fertilizer prices are low. And the reason why is that it allows you to target applications. A lot of times we'll put phosphorus and potassium on kind of as a general habit, but, but we may be able to get away with not putting any on this year. And by having that data, it allows us to target those applications. So we're putting on those pastures exactly what we need. Just a couple soil sampling tips. Now, I know a lot of you have row crops, uh, soil sampling and pastures and hay fields, just a couple extra things to consider, right? Um, the accuracy of the results that you're going to get is going to depend on the sample you submit. So if that sample is not representative of that pasture or hay field, then the results are not going to be very good. 
We want samples to, to represent less than 20 acres. My computer's a little slow tonight. We want to take 15 to 20 cores kind of in a zigzag pattern as this diagram shows here. Um, we always want to use a soil probe. In the past, we said, oh, you can use a shovel or, or, or whatever as long as you uh, get that soil sample. But a soil probe is really the best way to do it. And if you don't have one, I'm sure that your extension agent can help you get one. And we want to sample to a four inch depth. Our recommendations at the University of Kentucky are based on a four inch depth. So, and, and I know you're saying, why is he even bother telling me this? I, I'll tell you why, because when I go to a field day and I say, how deep should you be soil sampling? The answers I get are two to 20 inches usually. So, so, um, so make sure that you're sampling to the right depth because that's going to impact the results you get back from the soil testing lab. And then we want to avoid areas where animals congregate at. So if you're sampling a pasture, you want to avoid shade areas, water areas, where you fed hay at, where the mineral feeder is, um, where if you're feeding commodity feeds or creep feed, you want to avoid those areas. So anywhere where animals congregate at, they're going to tend to concentrate nutrients through the deposition of dung and urine. And if you include those areas in your soil sample, it's going to give you a false result. It's going to elevate your results. And then make sure you get with your extension agent and do the right paperwork. You know, it's hard to get a good recommendation back if they don't know what you want. And this is, a, I'm not saying this because I wrote it, but Edwin and Ritchie and I put this together. He's a soil scientist at the research station. This is a really nice soil sampling publication. It just reminds you of all those things we just went over. And, and Katie or, or Jessica that are in the back there can get you a copy of this. And it's nice because it's back and front. So a lot of times when, when us academics write stuff, you know, it's 10 pages long. Well, nobody's going to read that. This is back and front, and it's bulleted. It's easy to read, and it, it brings the main points out of, of what you need to remember when you're soil sampling. Okay, tip number three. If there was ever a year to apply lime, it's this year. So fertilizer prices have gone crazy. Lime has been relatively stable. It's going to go up a little bit because of the current petroleum costs in the trucking, but but... Relatively speaking, it hasn't gone up as, as much as uh, fertilizer. So soil acidity is a major factor that limits forage production, not only in Kentucky, but the whole southeastern United States. And it does two things. It reduces nutrient availability in the soil, and it also reduces nitrogen fixation by legumes. And, and it, a dollar a pound of nitrogen, every pound of nitrogen a legume fixes and brings into that grazing system is really important right now. So this, this diagram just shows the impact that soil pH has on nutrient availability. We've got on this end of the diagram a very acid soil, on this one a very alkaline soil, and around the middle it's neutral. So And then each one of these different bands on here is a different nutrient. And the wider the band is, the more plant available that nutrient is. So what I want you to notice is that when we look in the ideal pH range, which is going to be between 6 and 7 for pastures, that's when all of our, our primary and secondary nutrients, nitrogen and phosphorus and potassium and calcium and magnesium and so on, that's when they're all the most plant available. So when you need lime, according to your soil test, you apply it, it neutralizes soil acidity, you're going to make all the other nutrients in that pasture more plant available. So liming is going to neutralize soil acidity and supply some calcium and magnesium. The general guidelines are here. Generally speaking, for a grass-clover mixture, we want that pH to be 6 to 6.4. Okay, tip number four, don't apply P and K if you're in a medium soil test range. Now, when you get your soil test results back, and, and depending where you send them to, university or private, the, the recommendations can vary a little bit. When you get your results back, 
If you're in that medium range, they're going to want you to put a little phosphorus and potassium on to build, build up the soil so that you get to that medium plus high range. This is not the year to do that, guys. This is a year to kind of hold tight, especially if you're in that medium range. And the, the reason that we're saying that is if you look on these yield response curves, this is for phosphorus and this one's for potassium. If we look at the medium range, even on the low end of the medium range, we've achieved over 80% of the yield potential of that pasture. So we can get a little bit of a response when we put, a, put more uh, phosphorus or potassium on, but, but we have captured most of that yield if we're in the medium soil test range. So if your pastures are testing in that medium soil test range, don't, don't put phosphorus or potassium on this year. Wait till the price moderates. Tip number five, implement rotational stocking. I bet you're sitting there saying, boy, that doesn't sound like a soil fertility tip, right? I'm a grazing guy, I'm, I'm a forage guy. But, but really, one of the big benefits of rotational stocking is, is not only the, the increase in productivity, which is this is showing, this was a summary of literature. Each one of these bars is a replicated study that shows the advantage in yield increasing your product, pasture productivity by switching from a continuous to a rotational stocking system. And that advantage is 30%. So we're gonna get an increase of 30% in productivity when we switch from a continuous to a rotational stocking system. That doesn't happen all at once, it happens over time as that system improves. But 30% is a pretty big advantage. There's not many things that we can do in agriculture that's gonna give us an increase in productivity of 30%. In fact, you know, in a row crop operation, if I put a new input into the system and I get four or five bushels more out of that, out of that yield, I'm pretty happy about that. So, so there's a number of advantages to, to rotational stocking. The first one is that increase in productivity. The second advantage that we don't, we don't really talk enough about is animal handling. So when I'm out there and I'm moving animals from pasture to pasture and I'm spending more time with them, animal handling is going to improve because something good, good is happening to those animals in, instead of me just bringing them up once a year to, to wean the calves and, and uh, so on. Another advantage to rotational stocking that we don't talk enough about is the impact that it has on the drought tolerance of the pasture. So what we do to the top of that plant impacts what's below the ground. So if I graze that pasture continuously and it never gets over, over this tall, then my root system is gonna be relatively small in that grass plant. When I, when I rest that pasture between grazing events, my root system, and I leave some residual in that pasture so I'm not grazing it all the way down to the soil surface, that root system is gonna be much larger and that's gonna make that pasture more drought tolerant. One of the first things that people notice when they switch from a continuous to rotational stocking system is that pastures grow longer into a drought stress and they come out of that drought stress faster. Um, the, last, the last advantage is that rotational stocking improves nutrient distribution in grazing systems. And, and that's kind of where this tip comes in soil fertility wise. So when, when we have a large continuously grazed pasture like the one on this um, diagram here, Animals are going to go out and they're going to graze and then they're going to come back to where? Shade and water, right? And they're going to hang out there, they're going to ruminate and, and then they're going to get up. And what happens when they get up? Well, you know, they make a deposit, right? So, so over time what happens is we take nutrients from, from here and we transport them to the shade and water and we concentrate them there. So when we switch from a continuous stocking system to a rotational stocking system. We subdivide those pastures, we provide water in those pastures, and then we put the animals in one of these paddocks, we let them graze, and, and we say, well, you know, you're gonna graze here and then you're gonna deposit those nutrients here, and then we move them to another one. So over time, what we get is a much more uniform distribution of nutrients. So we're not concentrating nutrients in one area of the pasture, we're keeping them better distributed throughout the grazing system. And that's a big advantage of rotational stocking that we don't talk enough about. The smaller the paddocks, the better the distribution is gonna be. All right, tip six. Capitalize on, 
on nutrients and hay. So it, every bale of hay has nutrients in it, right? It's got about 40 pounds, 50, 40 to 50 pounds of nitrogen. It's got about 15 pounds of P2O5 or phosphorus. And then it's got somewhere around 50 to 60 pounds of potash, depending on the hay and, and the fertility when you made it. And, and if we assume that the, the cost are the ones that I showed you at the beginning, 90 cents for nitrogen, 55 cents for P2O5, and 65 cents for K2O, and we do that math, I'm not going to make you do the math. Every ton of hay right now at current fertilizer prices is going to have more than $80 worth of nutrients in it. More than $80. So how do you think somebody on, on Facebook Marketplace that's selling a roll of hay for, for $30, how do you think he's doing? He, he, he hasn't done the math is what I'm telling you. So, yeah, and you're right. You have to be careful what you buy when you buy it on Facebook Marketplace. There's no question about that. But there's some decent hay out there. So, so what I'm telling you now is that even if you're making your own hay, you, you've got to capitalize on the nutrients in your own hay and make sure that they're getting well distributed within the grazing system. So how do we do that? When we feed hay, we, the ideal situation would be that we feed it on our poorest pasture. So if I've got a pasture that I know that I need to build fertility up in, that's a great pasture to feed hay on. And then we move our feeding points around. And I know, I know there are people in here that have built feeding pads. And feeding pads are nice because they give you a, a spot where you can get in to drop that hay. But that's not ideal, right? Because you're concentrating nutrients on those, in, on, on and around those feeding pads. And then you're going to have to pick that manure up, haul it back out, and spread it somewhere. And even when you do that, you don't capture the... Uh, a large proportion of those nutrients. So, so the ideal situation would be if it's possible, you move your feeding points around. I don't care how you do it. You can use a bale wagon. You can unroll hay in your pastures. You can move, uh, use hay rings and move them around your pasture. Or you could use something like bale grazing. And, and there's a great video on our um, KY Forge's YouTube channel on bale grazing by Greg Halleck. And there's another really good video by um, the extension agent from uh, Adair County, Nick Roy. And this was a symposium at the Kentucky Cattlemen's Association on building, and his, his video was on building fertility using hay. Those are two outstanding videos, and I would encourage everyone in this room to watch them. It'll take you about a half an hour per video to watch those, but they're well worth your time, and it'll just start to help you think about how, how I can build fertility on my farm by, um, by uh, how I utilize hay in my grazing system. So, so this is the, the common scenario. This is that pasture that I showed you earlier, subdivided. The common scenario is that I choose one paddock to feed my hay in, right? You don't raise your hands if you do this. But I choose one paddock and I put it in. Well, I don't put them all out at once, but I feed my hay in there. I'll haul them in. And I usually choose one that's convenient, right? Close to a hard surface road that I can get in and out of when it's wet and, and muddy in the wintertime. I drop a hay bale in there. So remember, how, how, much, how many nutrients were in a, bale, a ton of hay? About 50 pounds, $8 worth, about 50 pounds of nitrogen, about 15 pounds of phosphorus, and about 50 or 60 pounds of, of potash. So if I feed all my hay here, I'm concentrating all those nutrients in one pasture, right? Would, would you ever hook a fertilizer buggy up, drag it into one pasture, and spread all your fertilizer in one pasture? Pr probably not. Probably not. So, so the ideal situation is that somehow you can kind of spread that, that hay feeding points out. And, and the better you, job you do at that, the more you're going to capitalize on those nutrients in that hay. And that's really going to be important as uh, fertilizer prices are high. Um, Greg Halleck talks a lot about bale grazing. And, and you can debate bale grazing if you, you'd like to. But 
but it does get a, the nutrients distributed well within grazing systems. And what bale grazing is, is you would come in that pasture when it's, when it's dry, and you would set bales out, usually in, in early winter, in December, um, before things really start to get ugly. And you would kind of just set those bales out. And Greg's got all the details in his presentation on the density and so forth. But you set them out, and then you start at your water source. And just like you would um, ration tall fescue out, you put a, a hot wire up. And then you just continuously move that hot wire as the animals graze those bales. And as you move through that pasture, you're going to utilize that hay, and you're going to get a much more uniform distribution of nutrients by using this method. And you can use this in, con in conjunction with stockpiling. So if I stockpile this pasture, I'm getting the hay that I put up, plus I'm getting some pretty high quality forage in terms of that stockpile for those animals, especially if you're in a fall calving system and you need a little bit extra nutrition on those animals. This was the, um, this was the uh, a couple of videos on our KY Forages YouTube channel. And to get to the KY Forages YouTube channel, just Google KY Forages YouTube. It'll be the first thing that pops up. And then you can, uh, you can look at the videos on here. And there's a couple of good videos. This was the one by Nick Roy, and this is the one by Greg Halleck in terms of uh, building fertility with hay feeding. All right, tip number seven, incorporate legumes into your grazing system. It, there's never been a better time to put clover in your pastures. When, when nitrogen's a dollar a pound, every pound of nitrogen that legume can fix from the air, and the air is 78% nitrogen that we're breathing, but it's not available to the plant. But those legumes form a symbiotic relationship with the bacteria that infects the root of that plant. And in that relationship, that bacteria fixes that nitrogen from the air into a plant available form, shares it with the legume plant, and in return, that bacteria gets um, sugars and carbohydrates as an energy source from that plant. This is after, after photosynthesis. This is the second most important biochemical process on Earth. So incorporate legumes into your grazing system. I just went over this. Legumes increase both the yield and quality of pastures and, and subsequently animal performance. They can improve summer growth. And a big one for us in Kentucky is that they dilute the negative impact of the endophyte in tall fescue. So the endophyte in tall fescue, that's a fungus that infects the tall fescue plant that lives between the cells. That causes lower animal performance in the summertime. It causes vasoconstriction, that means the vascular system of the animal, the blood vessels get smaller. And the way a cow cools itself in the summertime is it pumps the blood to the skin and then the heat dissipates off the animal. Well, if, if that vascular system smaller, it has a harder time cooling itself and um, it essentially runs a low-grade fever all summer. And that reduces animal performance. So. An interesting thing that our USDA forage research unit in, in Lexington has found that some of the compounds in red clover actually counteract the negative impact of the endophyte. So it's a vasodilator. It actually causes the blood vessels to dilate again. So it, that is a perfect reason for including red clover in your frost seeding program. So this is just the value of nitrogen when, when it costs a dollar. If I look at the different legumes, alfalfa is our most aggressive nitrogen fixer. The value of the nitrogen fixed by alfalfa will be somewhere between $150 and $250 per acre. Now, most people don't have the sole resources and pastures to use alfalfa, but something like red clover and white clover is going to bring somewhere between $75 and $200 worth of nitrogen into that system every year. So it, if there was ever a time this, this year, lime and clover are, are your real friends. Now, one thing to remember about, about um, legumes is that we, we often talk about it, and I just did it, like it's, putting a bag, like it's putting a bag of nitrogen on that pasture, and it's not quite like that. 
that nitrogen has to get shared um, with the grass plant. So the legume plant doesn't say, hey, buddy, have a little bit of my nitrogen. It has to be shared with that grass plant and it's shared indirectly. And the grazing animal is an important part of that sharing. So it, the legume fixes that nitrogen in conjunction with the bacteria on the root system. And then the animal grazes that legume and then it uses some of the nitrogen, but most of it is, is excreted in the urine of the animal back onto the pasture and that enters the nutrient cycle. So that grazing animals are really important part of that, of that nitrogen cycle. If we, if we do a good job with grazing management and a good job with legumes in our pastures, then we can build a very strong nitrogen cycle over time. But you have to work at it. It's not, it's not free. Well, it's, it's kind of free, but not, not completely free. You've got to seed a little bit of clover every couple of years, and then you've got to start to manage those pastures in a rotational stocking system to get a good distribution of that dung and urine. And then it's also shared when that clover plant dies or it gets trampled, it's going to share uh, that nitrogen as that plant breaks down. Okay, tip eight. So frost seed clover. We're, we're getting a little bit on the late side for frost seeding clover right now. If you were going to frost seed clover, if, if you read the Cow Country News, that tip was in there two months ago, right? So we, we like to see it come on by about mid-February. And that makes sure that there's enough frost, freezing and thawing cycles to incorporate that seed into the soil surface. So all frost seeding is is broadcasting that seed um, on top of the soil surface and then allow, allowing those freezing and thawing cycles to incorporate it. Works best with red, red and white clover. Not, not as well with grasses in alfalfa. And um, the good general recommendation is six to eight pounds of red clover and one to two pounds of ladino clover. If we can get five or six pounds of red clover on in, in a pound of ladino clover, we're going to do pretty good. So just a few tips to enhance your success of frost seeding. We want to make sure that we graze our pastures close before we frost seed. That allows the seed get, to get to the soil surface. We need to get it on in plenty of time, so mid-February to have a lot of freezing and thawing cycles to incorporate it. We want to um, control post-seeding competition. So one of the biggest failures in frost seeding is that, that those seedlings have germinated but then we don't control that competition in the spring. So as that grass starts to break loose this time of the year, we want to we want to put animals on it. We want to keep it grazed close to let light in for those seedlings. We want to make sure we use high quality seed, use the correct seeding rate, and then get get even seed distribution. This one's a lot easier to say than actually do, right? So it's easy for me to say stand up here and say get even seed distribution in your pastures. It's pretty hard to tell where you've driven with a four-wheeler in a pasture when you're broadcasting seed. And, and uh, to that, we did this little study. I'll just take, take a minute and show you um, this. Uh, so my bonus tip is use a GPS when you're frost seeding. We don't, we don't often think about GPS in forage livestock operations, but this is one place where it can really work. Now, you don't have to go out and buy an expensive one. This unit was um, about $1,200. So when we used a GPS unit in a frost seeding study at the research station, we reduced our overlap, and the tendency was not to have misses, but the tendency in both years of this study was for people to drive closer than they should to make sure they didn't have any misses. And the average overlap was 35% between our two drivers for two years. And when we used a GPS unit, we reduced that to 3%. So it, it's a major, uh, a major cost savings when you use this GPS unit. So I'll just mention that we can recover the cost of the GPS unit when we frost seed as little as about 220 acres of clover. So if we're frost seeding 220 acres of, of clover, then we're going to recover that cost. Now the nice thing about these little portable GPS units is you can use them for a whole bunch of different things, right? We can spray with them. 
If we're spreading fertilizer, we can spread fertilizer with them. If we're putting lime on, we can put lime on. If we're spreading litter, we can spread litter with them. I mean, they're pretty handy. And the more you use them, the faster that recovery is going to be uh, in terms of, of recovering that cost, initial investment. Tip nine, manage nitrogen applications. We're, we're probably not going to put a lot of nitrogen on this year in a, in a dollar per pound. Um, but if you do, remember, it's only a good investment to put nitrogen on a pasture or a hay field if you're going to use it, right? If you're going to use that forage. So if I'm putting it on a pasture in the spring, what, what's the problem with pastures in the spring? We go from, from no grass to, to having a whole bunch of grass, right? So a lot of times we'll have more grass than we can use, and then we put nitrogen on, and, and we make that problem even worse. So generally, I, I tell people, if you're in a grazing situation, we probably don't want to put a lot of nitrogen on in the spring. Save it for late summer when you can use it to stockpile some grass for winter grazing. Um, recommendations for nitrogen are, are based on research, and they're normally come in some kind of a range. So if you're going to put nitrogen on a hay field, because you're going to be able to capture that dry matter in, in the form of conserved forage, Apply at the consider applying at the lower end of the of the recommendation range this year. Um, make sure you time application to plant growth. So if I was going to put nitrogen on a warm season pasture, I wouldn't put it on now, right? Because warm season pastures aren't growing now. But if I was going to put it on a fescue pasture, I'd wait just a little bit. And as that fescue really starts to take off, then I would time my nitrogen application with the growth. And the reason you do that is that that plant is actively growing. It's going to grab that nitrogen that's in the system, and we're going to have very little loss of nitrogen from that system. Now, one thing to remember is that sometimes we, we don't get the nitrogen response in pastures, especially well-managed pastures, that we think we should. And that's because we can develop a very strong nitrogen cycle in that pastures by using legumes and good grazing management. Okay, tip 10, my last tip of the day. Monitor hay fields closely. So I, I know we need hay, and many of you in this room make hay. Um, but we've got to watch it close right now. Remember, nutrient removal from, from a hay system is much higher than a grazing system. Remember, we removed very few nutrients from a grazing system, but from a hay system, every ton of hay that we're taking out, if we look, for example, at orchard grass, 36 pounds of nitrogen, 15 pounds of phosphorus, and 55 pounds of potash. That's every ton. So say I have a good year and I remove three tons of orchard grass per acre. Yeah, all of a sudden we're, we're somewhere in, in, in that range of, you know, 100 pounds of nitrogen, we're removing 45, 50 pounds of phosphorus, and we're removing 150 pounds of potash. Now we can do that. We've got some buffering capacity in the soil, and we can do that for a year or maybe two. But if we don't replace those nutrients over time, we're going to draw down production of that field greatly. So it'll, it'll start to give, give you less and less yield. And then we have weeds start to come into that, namely broom sage, as, as we uh, draw that fertility down. So if we're, if we're dipping down below that, that medium, low plus range, we really need to put fertilizer on, even if it's high, the phosphorus and potassium on hay fields. I'm just going to finish things up by showing you a couple of resources. This is our KY Forges YouTube channel. And you'll see on here, these are the videos from the uh, Kentucky Cattlemen's Association forages uh, at the Ca Kentucky Cattlemen's Association this year. Those three videos on uh, managing for soil fertility in pastures and hay fields when, when prices are high. Outstanding set of videos. There's probably 300 or more videos on this channel that you can go in and watch. Um, and it's funny, I was just in Missouri speaking at a grazing conference. I had four people come up and say, hey, I watch your YouTube channel. And my wife always says, who, who in the world would watch that channel? But, but somebody does, apparently. Last year, we had 120,000 views on this channel. So simply Google KY Forages YouTube to find the channel. 
Uh, the other great resource that we have is our Forges website. I, I think it's one of the best in the country, and, um, and the credit goes to, to Ray Smith and Jimmy Henning in, in Lexington. They do a lot of work on this webpage. We've got upcoming events, and then we've got all, all the Forge-related information organized under these tabs, and I think there's, there's uh, about 12 of these tabs, and you can just click on hay if you want to know about hay, or, or there's one for alfalfa, there's one for forage species, and so on. Simply Google UKY forages to find this. It'll be the first thing that pops up. And, and then the last thing I want to leave you with is, is probably one of the great, greatest resources we have, and that's our variety testing program. We have a tremendous variety testing program in, in Kentucky. So we're testing all varieties of clover, orchard grass, tall fescue, summer annuals like sorghum Sudan grass, Sudan grass, pearl millet, and, and these results are reported every year. And you find it by simply clicking on that variety trial um, tab there. And it brings you to our variety testing page. And it's updated annually. And then at the bottom, there'll be an archive of past reports. So what you'll see this year is our reports for 2021 year. And, and this is probably the most important publication on there. So there's an individual publication for every different species, forage species, but this is a long-term summary. And, and I'm just going to show you how to use this. And it is for all the different forage species that we test. And yes, I know you can't read this, but there is a crabgrass trial in there too where we're evaluating different crabgrass varieties. So this is what one of those charts will look like. And I know you can't read it, so I'm going to just um, blow a couple numbers up for you. This last, so this shows the different sites on top, Lexington and Princeton. And then it, it shows if that variety, so say for example, we look at, well, they don't show on the TV. It shows if there's a number in this, it, that means it was tested in that particular year in location for that variety. And that's summarized in the last column. So if we look at, for example, at Kenland, a red clover, it shows 110 here and 28. The 110 is the, is the related to the average. So if it was 100, it would be average for the trial. So what we recommend is 100 or better. So that means it's average or better. Kenland um, was 110. So it's 10% above average. Now, the important, this second number in the parentheses is really important, too. It says 28. That's the number of years it was, has been tested in that trial. It's been tested 28 site years. That means a location in a year. It, and that means that we have great faith in that number. Now, if it was tested once or twice, then we have less faith. But, but this shows that this particular variety is, is very good. And that happens to be Kenlin certified seed. Kenlin was selected to the University of Kentucky a long time ago. It's an old variety, but it's still a very good variety. And if you can get Kenlin certified seed, then I would highly recommend that variety. It tends to be a little bit more economical than some of the newer varieties. All right, below it is another variety. It's got 70. So that means it was 70% of the average. It's 30% below the average for the trial. That's not a variety you want to use. Now, the interesting thing is that it's Kenlin too, but it's uncertified. When, when it says uncertified, that means that you don't know what's in that bag. It could be anything. Even though it has the Kenlin name, if you want to make sure that you're getting the variety that's on the seed tag, then you need to use certified seed. And I'm done. Is there any questions? I, I know there was a question during dinner about repairing hay feeding areas. And um, I think in the last issue, who's got that cow country news? It is, what was my article on the last issue there? I think it was on repairing hay feeding areas. So, so I would highly recommend getting that publication. And, um, and there, if, if you don't get it and you want it, then talk to Katie or Jessica. We've got an um, extension publication that's on repairing hay feeding areas. And she can print that out for you. It's a pretty short publication. It's, it's very good, and it goes through the options. 
So there's two primary options for repairing hay feeding areas. The, the first one is that we go in this time of year, as soon as we get in there, and we try to level those areas out, and then we plant some fescue in, and clover in there. That can, can work, but, but a lot of times it doesn't work as good as you think because it, the plants hardly have, by the time we get dried out, and by the time we get things smoothed up, it's getting later into spring, early summer. We, we plant it, it kind of comes up, but, but so does a lot of weeds, right? So we get a lot of spiny amaranth, and cockleburr, and so forth there. The, the better option, the better option is to use a summer annual grass, and, and probably sorghum Sudan grass is the best one. So we wait a little bit, we get it smoothed up until the soil temperature gets around 60 degrees, and then we plant a, a summer annual in there. And the summer annual, like a sorghum Sudan grass, gets out of the ground so fast, and it gets good canopy closure, and that canopy closure shades out things like spiny amaranth and other weeds in that stand. And that's a, a pretty good option. And that annual is, and then if we want to, we can come back in the fall and reseed tall fescue and orchard grass when weed pressure is lower. Um, a lot of times in these heavy use areas um, that we have to revegetate, you know, they're going to just get disturbed again that, that next fall and winter. So, um, so spending a lot of money on perennials is not probably a good investment. No, no fertilizer on these areas because these areas that have concentrated uh, traffic usually are pretty high in, in nat naturally occurring soil fertility through dung and urine deposition. Any questions? Well, th thank you for your attention tonight. I'll be around if you have any questions.